As SpaceX's Starship took to the skies last week during its inaugural launch, its Super Heavy Booster inflicted untold damage to the launch pad below, blasting through layers of concrete and dredging up watery folds of the Earth. It's a fact that everyone can see clearly, but instead of getting frustrated and giving up, the SpaceX team has now started researching and fixing the launch pad. The tank farm is also part of the structures that took great damage. There's a suspected liquid oxygen leak from one of the upright liquid oxygen tanks, and several vertical water tanks took some hits deep enough to dent them. These tanks are predicted to be beyond repair, but the good news is that SpaceX is already working on those tanks again. Hopefully, the damage can still be controlled. Aside from that, crews are now able to access the innermost parts of the orbital launch mount. A Grove crane removed the east side booster quick disconnect door. The condition of the BQD seems good. It has extended from the hood. However, its westward door was blown off at launch. SpaceX probably needs at least half a year to get things back to normal on the Starbase launch pad, but its bigger obstacle remains to be the FAA. The Federal Aviation Administration has grounded SpaceX's Starship prototypes as it completes a mishap investigation designed to determine issues with the launch vehicle, their effect on the environment, and to ensure the safety of the nearby populace for subsequent launches. Each commercial launch license handed out by the FAA requires the user to have an approved mishap plan in place detailing what should happen in the event of an issue arising during a launch, and so the FAA's move to halt Starship launches is both inevitable and predictable. What we don't know is how long the probe will delay the Starship program. Mishap investigations can last several months, and the FAA will want to be satisfied that any system, process, or procedure related to the mishap will not put the public's safety at risk during the next launch attempt. SpaceX will also need to complete additional environmental mitigations according to an email from the FAA sent to CNBC. This is because debris from the launch entered adjacent properties during the recent orbital attempt. Three months ago, we started building a massive water-cooled steel plate to go under the launch mount, tweeted Musk. Wasn't ready in time, and we wrongly thought, based on static fire data, that Fondag, or concrete, would make it through one launch. Looks like we can be ready to launch again in one to two months. This would be an ambitious schedule to keep considering the scale of the upgrade and the need for renewal of the FAA's approval. SpaceX's engineers will also need to spend the coming months figuring out exactly why several of Super Heavy's Raptor engines failed during the previous launch attempt, and also diagnose and formulate a solution to the staging issue that prevented Starship from detaching from its booster. Next off, a Japanese lunar lander launched by SpaceX's broomstick, carrying a rover developed in the United Arab Emirates, attempted to find its footing on the moon's surface Tuesday, and potentially marked the world's first lunar landing for a commercially developed spacecraft. Regrettably, attempts by ground flight controllers to re-establish contact were unsuccessful, leading the company to presume that the spacecraft was lost. The lander, developed by Japanese firm iSpace, was launched on December 11th atop SpaceX's Falcon 9 from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Following a three-month voyage, the spacecraft entered orbit around the moon using a low-energy trajectory, covering approximately 1.4 million kilometers through space. The landing was anticipated to take place on Tuesday at 12.40 p.m. ET, which equates to Wednesday at 1.40 a.m. Japan Standard Time. After a communication blackout was anticipated, the mission control team worked to regain contact with the vehicle for several minutes. iSpace's CEO Takeshi Hakamata delivered an update roughly 20 minutes after the scheduled landing time, stating that they had not been able to confirm a successful landing and that the lunar lander was likely not able to complete the landing on the moon's surface. Despite this setback, iSpace's engineers were able to obtain data from the vehicle until the attempted landing, which should aid in future missions. The Hakuto R lunar lander carrying the Rashid rover, the first Arab-built lunar spacecraft constructed by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in Dubai, was involved in the mission. To date, only the United States, the former Soviet Union, and China have successfully conducted controlled moon landings, with the United States being the only country to have sent humans to the moon.
iSpace's approach was unique as the company sought to land its spacecraft on the moon as a for-profit venture rather than under the auspices of a single nation. iSpace shared mission updates on its Twitter account, including a recent photo of Earth taken by the spacecraft as it traveled through lunar orbit. The company had anticipated setbacks, saying that any anomalies would be examined and incorporated into future missions already in development by 2025. The 10-kilogram Rashid rover was expected to explore the Atlas crater on the northeast of the moon during most of the 14-day lunar daytime if successful. It was equipped with a high-resolution camera on its front mast, another on its rear, as well as a microscopic camera and a thermal imaging camera, and it also carried a Langmuir probe to sample the plasma environment above the lunar surface, according to the European Space Agency. It's quite a pity, but then again, space is hard. Another example of the difficulties of space can be demonstrated via ULA's Vulcan. United Launch Alliance's plans for the first launch of its new Vulcan rocket have been complicated by a violent explosion during testing of the rocket's upper stage. ULA was targeting May 4th for the first launch of the Vulcan vehicle from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida with the rocket arriving at the site in late January. However, on the 29th of March, a Centaur upper stage suffered an anomaly and exploded during testing at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. ULA CEO Tori Bruno later shared footage of the incident on Twitter, revealing that the blast followed a hydrogen leak that then dramatically ignited. The upper stage that exploded was not part of the hardware for the first launch, but the investigation needs to be completed before Vulcan is cleared to fly. Bruno has since stated that the first Vulcan flight is likely going to be delayed into June or July, adding to years of delays to the program, including delayed delivery of engines built by Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos' aerospace company. He said that the company has not yet determined if the problem was the test article or the ground system. Vulcan already is years behind schedule due to delays in the development and testing of the Blue Origin BE-4 engine that powers the vehicle's first stage. The Space Force was expecting Vulcan to launch its first national security mission in late 2023, but that now appears unlikely. The vehicle was selected in 2020 to launch 60% of national security missions over five years. SpaceX won the other 40%. Randy Kendall, Vice President of Launch and Architecture Operations at the Aerospace Corporation, shared that depending on the outcome of the investigation, the Space Force would chart several paths to deal with the potential delays. Aerospace is a nonprofit that provides technical advice to the U.S. government as well as engineering and support services for the National Security Space Launch Program. Kendall said he could not comment on the specifics of the Centaur anomaly. The good news is that BE4 testing and qualification has come along really well. I don't anticipate they're going to have any challenges getting off the launch pad this year, he said. Under the terms of the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 contract won by ULA and SpaceX, Kendall said, if one of the providers is unable to perform a mission, the Space Force could choose to delay the mission or ask the other provider to step in. And that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and we'll see you soon.